So at the top of this list, then, we've got Silence of the Lambs, and that's just one of my all-time favorites, Gladys. Yeah, that's that's the Tell bench. me, Mom, did yeah. you breastfeed your baby? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. Made your nipples hard, didn't it? So don't bring me into this conversation. <laughs> Um, yeah, Silence of the Lambs, that's that's the gold standard, really. Um, the reason, I mean, Hannibal Lecter couldn't be. There's no such serial killer as Hannibal Lecter. I mean, he's too many characters all rolled into one to start with. Um, fascinating thing about that is that um, the writer, uh, he picked a guy called a Dr. Trevino who's in prison who had been gay and he'd killed his gay lover and chopped him up and put him in a box in a field. And he met this doctor in prison. Harris met the doctor in prison. And he and, and he was a quiet man. He was a very quiet man. He came across as a doctor in the prison, but he wasn't. And the thing was, Harris went away and he then developed this character into Hannibal. Now, the Dr. Trevino was eventually released from prison and went on to treat his patients over many years, he was a wonderful man. He just had that one case where he killed his lover. And the thing about... He was a wonderful man when he's not yeah, murdering the people. The thing about <laughs> Hannibal Lecter is, is the research that's gone behind it, which is fascinating. And you have to look really underneath. I mean, the whole film was supported by the FBI at mm. Quantico. They were the consultants. Um, so Anthony Hopkins went to some murder trials both actors were coached by psychiatrists and FBI agents, Clara Starling. She had an FBI agent helping her. And when you look actually underneath it, underneath the film, there are so many subtle nuances running throughout the film that you, the viewer wouldn't obviously see straight away. You'll see the, the, the guy with his arm in a sling. Now, that's been taken from Bundy's MO. Oh, yes. You see? And you'll see all these little bits of a jigsaw put together and that really is a gold standard for a fictional movie based on one true life character. And I don't think Dr. Trevino would ever have thought in a million years that it would become a multi-billion pound, million pound thing. So Buffalo Bill was wearing women's skins. Yep. How common is that in the real serial killer world? That was sort of drawn from Ed Gein. Uh, who uh, exhumed corpses and killed a couple of large ladies and then skinned them like deer, and then he made lampshades and he made a woman's suit, and that's how Buffalo Bill gets. And in, in if you watch the film The Green Mile, uh, the crazy guy in the, on the death row there that's throwing pee and shit everywhere... Um, they called him Buffalo Bill, and he said because he skins his humps. And that that was taken from the Green Mile. So you can see all these little twists and tw turns. In the Green Mile, you've got Percy Wetmore. People just don't Percy Wetmore. But, of course, he didn't wet the sponge, did he? All these little tiny things make it fascinating when you look at it. So so was that guy, was he the one who was wearing the skins and dancing under the full moon? Yeah. 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 I mean, people have... Um, couple of serial killers that I've interviewed have, have done sort of that on a smaller scale. Uh, but I'm working on a book at the moment called Cannibalism. Um, and uh, and and a lot of people do that sort of, well, in a smaller way. But um, then you've got the death's head mo moth in Silence of the Lambs. But that's actually from a painting. It's not actually a real death's head. But when you look at beh behind all the nuances behind that film, once you start seeing them, the film becomes so much more enjoyable. Yeah, I think Buffalo Bill was one of the most fascinating characters. What do you have to say about Buffalo Bill? Well, I think he's the guy that he he wanted to be a transvestite, and um, uh, but but the actual wearing of the woman's skin, he was he was trying to get its psychology into a woman's skin, so he he put he wore that sort of stuff. But but a lot of these killers do who are bisexual who want to be women, 
they obviously like dress up in women's clothes. I mean, there was that colonel we talked, I think, talked about last night, Colonel Russell Williams, a Canadian Air Force colonel who was cross-dressing all the time. And he ran an Air Force base. <laughs> God help us. So I recently watched a video on Patrick Brett David's channel, Valuetainment, and it was an ex-FBI guy. He was extremely highly decorated, and he was talking about the corruption of the FBI and how um, all these pe innocent people have been sent to prison. And they basically tell the labs, you know, give us this result and the propaganda. So do you think then that there is an agenda in the movies whereby the feds always make like the cops, like Clary Starling, these are the good guys that go in and kick the bad guys' asses but the reality is far more complex and there's far more corruption. I can't speak about corruption for the FBI. Um, I can say, obviously, there's a lot of bent, murderous, redneck cops in America shooting black guys and stuff like that. I mean, that's absolutely disgraceful, and black lives do matter very much. So get that off the way. As far as FBI agents go, um, I, I've never come across, and I've done a lot of work with the FBI at Quantico, they're solid guys. Well, where I, I get I get up, get upset is a lot of judges in these counties and redneck cops and sheriffs and DAs are as bent as you can get, and they're the ones that ultimately throw guys in jail that are innocent, and in some cases they they're executed. Um, that happened with um, Joseph Odell the third. I spoke to him just a few days before he was executed. He was innocent. Even the Pope begged, and but the police knew that he was innocent. And you got Fred Waterfield in Florida at the moment, who's um, serving a life sentence. His his buddy David Allen Gore, he was executed. Um, basically, fast tracked that was because he'd written to me in long letters telling me how he'd skinned his victims and hung them up which made Fred West look like a pussycat, really, what he, this guy did. But he, he, Gore got sti uh, f uh, Fred Waterfield got stitched up by the police. And and it's obvious that they stitched him up. Um, so you get a lot of that in the counties and stuff like that. And, I mean, in some cases, when you've got, a, like, for instance, Michael Ross in Connecticut, he, if you've got a body dumped in one jurisdiction... If if that county or that town hasn't got a lot of money, they will shift the body across the state line or county line and let somebody else investigate it. Yeah, being in the system, my lawyer got <laughs> Ray Crown, the snaggletooth killer, off who was innocent. And the state of Arizona paid an expert witness $50,000 to say that his teeth matched a mark on the victim and they suppressed the DNA that didn't match his DNA. Yeah. That's how corrupt it is and it just blew my mind. <laughs> I was for the death penalty before I realised all this. Well, yeah. So I mean, many people now on death row are innocent. Yeah. I, I work with one for 10 out of London and they've gone and filmed a load of exonerees. They estimate at least 10%. I've um, seen lawyers estimate up to a third of people innocent. On yeah, well, don't row. get on a death penalty because that will tiss me right off. <laughs> <laughs> I, do you know what I think about the death penalty? And this I've been asked this many times, Sean. What happens is, you know, if a county or a state want the death penalty, that's their call. It's not for me to poke my nose or anybody else to influence them. Whether it's morally right or wrong, that's something else. But what I always say is this. If somebody's evil enough to go out and chop up a little kid and rape a family and then at the end go, oh, I'm sorry, but, you know, I always say to people, imagine if that was your child that had been chopped up. So there's two sides of the... Yeah, yeah. Story. If you could conclusively show that that person had done that, they've got nothing coming, yeah. definitely. But because of the corruption, all the innocent people are getting executed. I don't think it's worth it. That's a debate for another day. It is. It is. Let's move on. <laughs> Let's move on. All right. So have you read the actual books, all of Harris's books? Yes. Do you think that the um, he kind of went a bit off track over the course of his books, or do you think he maintained the brilliance of the first one? Look, every, the first movie or the first book's always great. Yeah. And then the system kicks in, the money men kick in and go, oh, we'll make a sequel. Yeah. Now, um, Sir Anthony Hopkins actually didn't want to do the the second two. Yeah. He'd had enough. 
and you can always see with sequels, and we'll come to the Amityville horror in a minute. Um, with sequels, it gets watered down. Yeah, the first one's got the impact. The first Godfather was brilliant. Yes, and then after that, it's it's like a victim of its own success. Let's try and make this at a slightly cheaper budget. Uh, we're bringing in some actors that are not, but we'll use the mate the the first notoriety of the first mill. So it becomes a marketing exercise. And it loses his gloss. I'd rather have a movie that is a one-off true crime movie or documentary series, which is absolutely brilliant, and leave it at that. Yeah, because I watched them all. I read them all, and even some of his descriptions just seemed rushed, and some seemed bizarre in his as it, as the series went. Yeah, along. because all of his talent went into the first one. Yeah, and then the publishers turn around and say, "Look, come on." Can we have another one? Yeah. And he's struggling because he doesn't really... But it's the money, isn't it? It's the yeah, money trial. Yeah. 